Thank you all for joining us to the SFU CED public lecture for November 24th, 2022. Uh, my, my name is Ryan Watmo, uh, my colleague Lee McGregor. We'd like to welcome you here. But before we get started with this very special public lecture, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I'm honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, the shared unceded home of the Squamish, the Kiskanuk, the Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley, Métis. Since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program, or SFUCD for short, has been a leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Defined by our professor, Sean Markey, CED is an approach for generating economic opportunity and addressing social and ecological issues at the local level. CED has also been understood simply as a holistic approach to community problem solving by Schaefer et al. At its foundation, the economy is a system for meeting the needs of individuals and communities. So, CD is an approach for meeting needs and solving problems in a socially inclusive and ecologically sustainable man manner. From a theoretical perspective, with clear implication for the practice of CD, researchers refer to a set of five principles that help differentiate CD from other traditional forms of economic development, featured there on the screen. It's my pleasure to introduce SFU CD public lecture presenter, David Allen. David became the executive director of Asset Management BC on July 1st of this year. He's a retired chief administrative officer of the city of Courtney with significant municipal experience, including prior positions at four other local BC governments. For the past eight years, he has had the role of co-chair of the AMBC Community of Practice. And David is the author of The Four Cs, a regular contributor to the AMBC newsletter, and is a passionate advocate of asset management. David and I met during our time in Golden, BC about a decade ago, and I saw firsthand how he integrated asset management into many municipal planning activities and community conversations. David, thank you for joining us today. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Ryan, and for the opportunity to present in SFU's Community Economic Development Public Lecture Series. And thanks to all of those that are um, joining us uh, today. I've been asked to speak to you about asset management and the links between asset management and community economic development and potential linkages also to Indigenous economic uh, reconciliation. Strong fundamental connections and principles exist between asset management and CED. Both are primarily community controlled, place-based, focused on human livelihood and wellness and represent a systems approach to sustainability. My presentation will start with a short video introduction to asset management, uh, move on to an overview of uh, uh, asset management BC, and then move through why asset management is necessary, what it is, and how it can be implemented at a high level. So hopefully you'll see this video. First of all, I'll start with um, Asset Management BC. Um, this is the next couple of slides are basically the vision and uh, a mission statement. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, Asset Management is at its core about sustainable service delivery. Uh, it's outlined uh, in these next two slides. Um, the vision and mission statements are focused on the goal of delivering sustainable services and supporting and empowering local governments to that end. Um, AMBC, Asset Management BC, uh, was established in 2008. And for the first nine years, uh, it operated with the financial support of the province um, of C and UBCM and uh, the volunteer efforts of a few dedicated individuals. I was one of them actually as co-chair um, at the time of Asset Management BC. And um, it was focused on developing resources and tools, delivering workshops and training, 
uh, developing and managing uh, the AMBC website and publishing newsletters, uh, as well as supporting BC communities in implementing asset management practices. And as you can see from the mission statement, it's consistent with the asset management, management for sustainable service delivery, the framework we call it um, in short form. Um, it's uh, basically focused on learning, you know, uh, assisting learning and education, sharing and developing and collaborating uh, asset management best practices through uh, the AMBC community practice. And uh, more recently, uh, three or four uh, regional communities of practice. Um, ongoing efforts include uh, the website, as I mentioned. Uh, we're also uh, uh, working to um, make our uh, annual conference, uh, truly an annual conference. Obviously, the pandemic put uh, a hold on that for three years, but we finished a very successful conference, uh, I think, in the beginning of uh, November. Uh, so we hope to build on that. Uh, I was pleased to see that there was uh, uh, almost 30, 30% or 33% really of the um, uh, participants, registrants at that uh, conference were First Nation uh, from First Nation communities. Uh, this slide just shows the 10 different partners that are part of AMBC. Um, it's governed by a partnership uh, committee. Uh, the 10 partners, uh, I won't list them off, but they're, um, they're all uh, local government associations or affiliated with the, the province or uh, professions in local government. Um, the main key priority areas are outreach and awareness, uh, education and capacity building, uh, partner collaboration and engagement, and um, organization development uh, and resiliency. Um, it's a bit interesting and somewhat ironic that um, Asset Management BC um, has to focus on its own uh, Resiliency, but um, that's just the nature of um, of local government uh, nonprofits. So um, I think we're we're finding it uh, quite interesting, especially during these times, with the opportunities that are out there to engage and train and build best practices in asset management across the province. So um, this is really the fundamental and foundational element, uh, I guess you could say, um, of Asset Management BC. It's called Asset Management for Sustainable Service Delivery, a BC framework. As I mentioned earlier, that we just call it the framework. It's quite a mouthful otherwise. Uh, the framework uh, establishes a high-level uh, systematic approach that supports local governments in moving towards service uh, asset and financial sustainability through an asset management process. Um, the framework addresses why asset management is necessary, uh, what asset management is, how it can be implemented from a high level. Um, the framework also recognizes that there are many components within the asset management process and provides a circular continuous pathway to link all the components of the process together. Uh, the framework's been developed to recognize uh, the diversity of BC communities. Um, it recognizes that asset management and practices that support asset management must be scalable to community size and capacity. Uh, we know that we've got, um, I think it's 164 or so uh, local governments in BC, and they're quite diverse, uh, both in terms of size and the services that they offer. So. The framework focuses on desired outcomes rather than prescribing a specific methodology or methodologies that allow uh, local governments to develop and implement an approach that can be both um, incremental um, and measured, um, tailored to the individual needs and capacity um, of each local government. Um, Further, the, the framework reflects uh, on current best practices and aligns uh, with uh, and is supported by internationally accepted best practices, such as uh, the International Infrastructure Management Manual. It's called the short form as IIIM and the ISO 55000 standard uh, 
it's actually now um, a series of, of standards uh, in the 55,000 series um, on asset management. It also has a section dedicated to additional resources and tools, uh, you know, which identify additional best practices. Um, and it showcases, I think, quite helpfully, um, see case studies that are supported um, with uh, topic specific primers. I'm just going to get into those in a, in a minute here. Um, finally, uh, the, the framework is a living document and um, it recognizes uh, best practices uh, change and uh, are updated. And that's why the framework is, um, is updated uh, periodically. Uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, the in uh, initial release was 2014. And um, I was part of the, the, the group that um, was involved in putting the framework together um, and uh, was also um, pleased to be involved in the updated version in 2019. It is funded uh, through what was uh, called the gas tax, but now it's the CCDF, the Canadian uh, Communities Billing Fund. Um, and uh, what makes asset management, I think, more of a, a, uh, an important and topical uh, element in local government service delivery is the fact that it's, um, it's part of that BC ca uh, gas tax agreement that uh, runs till 2024. Um, and it's uh, right now in BC, it's not mandated, but um, uh, expect, uh, expecting to receive uh, grant funding is, uh, is connected with, uh, you know, going forward with uh, asset management uh, uh, planning and programming. So what is asset management? Uh, it's really the process of integrating people's skills and actions uh, with information about the community's built and nature-based infrastructure assets, um, as well as the financial resources uh, to ensure long-term sustainable service delivery. Sound asset management practices support sustainable service delivery. Um, it's a process, um, it's a team sport, we like to call it. Uh, it, it, it to be effective, it has to be organization wide um, and supported that uh, throughout the organization. Um, it's a it's a journey of continuous improvement that involves everyone in local government in consultation with community residents. This is what we commonly refer to as the the wheel, the asset management wheel. Again, it was part of the um, the process. You can see from the wheel that. Um, Sustainable service delivery is right at the core of the wheel. Uh, moving out um, from there, you'll see that the elements of um, asset management are information, finances, uh, assets, and uh, people. Um, the next uh, layer, uh, circular layer, is, is uh, communicating, engaging, and reviewing. And then on the outside part of the circle, you've got um, uh, assess, plan, and implement. And the arrows uh, show the direction of that as a cyc cyclical um, annual process uh, um, is, is the sort of the preferred approach. You can start anywhere on that wheel. It doesn't matter where you start. Um, and, uh, but the thing, the key message that we, we send out to folks is don't wait for Perfection, don't let perfect, uh, perfection be the enemy of good is, is one of the sayings that's common in um, asset management practice. And, um, and so the key thing is to, is to get going early, um, uh, even if you don't think you have the, the information you need for a solid plan. So again, what is the goal of asset management? Uh, mentioned sustainable service delivery. Uh, you can see, I won't read out what's on the, the actual um, uh, slide, but um, it's how we provide services generally, uh, such as water, sewage treatment, roads, solid waste management, parks and recreation, the list goes on, uh, to our community in a way that fosters its social, environment, uh, environmental, and economic well-being. <clears throat> Delivering those uh, services sustainably ensures that current community service needs are met. It supports service delivery that is, again, as I mentioned, socially, environmentally, and economically responsible. 
Uh, it helps future generations meet their needs and considers uh, the community's priorities. It also reflects the balance of the trade-offs between available resources and uh, desired services. This slide depicts, uh, you know, the the four, two of the four primers: uh, climate change and not natural asset primers. Um, there's also some quotes uh, from a couple of uh, EMBC newsletters um, related to um, climate change and natural assets. There. Um, essentially, the four frame uh, four framework primers were developed uh, in uh, 2019 in uh, in recognition of the, the framework's role as a living document. Um, these were um, elements that hadn't been fully developed in the original 2014 pl uh, primer, and so we felt that this was an opportunity to add those on to the primer as. Um, as uh, their own specific documents related to these issues. The climate change primer notes that climate change is a threat to uh, sustainable service del delivery in that it amplifies the risk of asset failure. Um, climate change itself uh, amplifi amplifies the risk of asset failure and service uh, life. Uh, it can also lead to reduced levels of service. Um, increasing costs of managing risk and recovering uh, from more frequent emergencies. Um, and fortunately, asset management practices can increase the community's resilience and response to natural disasters. Um, asset management uh, based on a life cycle approach can also lead to um, the most significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in the planning and design stages. So the, the other, the third freight framework in the four is um, land uh, called the land use planning primer, the role, um, uh, the role of, uh, or rather the land use uh, planning primer. It, land use planning uh, determines the type, extent and cost of capital assets that are acquired and managed by local governments. More compact design um, and higher density save local governments hundreds of millions of dollars in asset management over the, the life cycles, um, the asset life cycles. Um, interestingly, uh, there's um, a tool that was developed several years ago by the province of, um, of BC. It's a community life cycle infra infrastructure costing tool. Um, and I can provide that link. In fact, you, if you just, um, Google that, you'll, you'll probably find, find it quite quickly, but basically it's a tool that looks at, um, at how different types of development, whether it be um, sort of your uh, typical uh, single family, um, you know, new green development versus uh, densification um, approaches and, and all, the, all the different var uh, variances of that. Uh, um, impact the cost of providing services uh, because of the nature of the assets that are, are required. So two critical things local governments can do to improve their asset management practices and the sustainability of their services are uh, one, to fully integrate asset management principles into land use planning, and two, um, consider um, land use within the asset management process. And I don't think, uh, frankly, that's been done very effectively yet. And so hence the, the reason for the primer. All local governments in BC have legislated land use planning powers. Um, they're also involved in providing services, uh, uh, the services needed to support land uses and invariably uh, these services rely upon assets, uh, you know, roads, pipe systems, treatment plants. We, you know, I've mentioned them before, parks, fire halls. Um, if a local government changes its land use plans, there's a very good chance that these changes will eventually impact existing assets and or require new assets. Um, as well, land use plans can significantly impact the long-term affordability of a service. Um, so there's no question that land use and asset management are inextricably uh, linked. Um, 
when I was uh, the CAO and, and Courtney um, I arrived there in 2013 and uh, was there until I retired uh, from local government, at least in a full-time role uh, in 2020, we initiated uh, an organizational, internal organizational review. And, and what we found was that we needed the best way to uh, implement asset management was to integrate um, you know, uh, all of the departments and uh, we came up with the, the notion that uh, it was sort of like the past, present and future. And the, the past um, and uh, was basically um, about uh, the, the renewal process of, uh, of asset management. So that's all the existing stuff that was coming up for renewal. Um, all the assets. Um, so engineering was was involved in that, you know, as a representative of renewal being the past. Um, it was also somewhat uh, uh, in, well, it was certainly involved in master planning as well. So that's more about the future. So they had a dual role in that regard. Um, the future was um, land use planning. And of course, that's where um, all of the decisions made about what type of development and planning uh, or planning and development really um, happened would would have these impacts and they were they became quite uh, noticeable uh, when you sat down and looked at the types of uh, development that were uh, typically being proposed. And then um, the, the present was uh, the current ongoing role of, uh, of operations and, and maintenance. Um, Public works, and that's where the fourth uh, primer comes in. Uh, the uh, the ongoing planning and uh, would, for example, uh, you know, be about uh, uh, what was going to happen. Um, then the development would occur, and then um, the uh, development would be complete, and the city would then be responsible in perpetuity. Uh, all the capital was built and paid for, but then the city was uh, responsible in perpetuity for the ongoing operations and maintenance and eventual renewal of uh, of uh, this uh, new development. So uh, this role of operations and maintenance uh, primer is, is designed to accomplish really three ob objectives. Um, one is to demonstrate the importance of O&M activities in the life cycle of the asset and the process of, of asset management. Um, two is to make the case that, uh, for proactive maintenance to improve service delivery and reduce life cycle costs. Um, and, uh, and three was to provide guidance to improve your organization's O&M uh, practices and align them with the asset management process. Um, again, uh, you can see from this graph that this re, uh, and I'm sorry, it's not very clear, um, but the reactive maintenance and gradual deterioration is, it happens uh, when you don't undertake proactive or planned maintenance. Another Courtney ad example was that when I arrived, oh, sorry about that, when I arrived, um, uh, I found that uh, the the public work staff uh, operations uh, folks were uh, always sort of the vast majority of the time lurching from from uh, crisis to crisis, and um, we found out that the, a lot of this had to do with uh, the fact that they were understaffed, uh, didn't have the the capacity uh, to actually do preventative and proactive maintenance. Um, I was able to. Um, uh, address that through uh, we collectively were able to address it, but you know I, I was able to um, get approval to to um, have that uh, have that paid for uh, through an ongoing annual operating surplus. Uh, the fact was we were um, we had money in the budget to do the work, but we didn't have the people to do it, and so um, by actually using that. Uh, annual operating surplus, we were able to hire five new staff and uh, start moving uh, the dial towards proactive maintenance. I mean, interestingly, they didn't even have a water flushing pro uh, program, an annual water flushing program, uh, which of course uh, led to all sorts of uh, challenges with um, uh, you know, the flow and provision of, uh, of uh, potable water. Um, Sorry, I'm flipping around here. Let me just move 
gradually. So the role of local government, um, uh, local governments are, are uh, this is a quote from uh, Mike Little, who's the mayor or was the mayor at the time. I'm, I'm not sure if he is now. Um, and you can read that uh, for yourself. But basically what he's saying is that if we do not um, uh, proceed with, um, uh, you know, with uh, doing proper uh, asset management planning and try to just artificially keep uh, low taxes and, and user fees to balance budgets that basically what we end up with is, um, is uh, possibly can be catastrophic. So it's critical uh, to, uh, you know, to undertake uh, sustainable service delivery to guarantee the future livability of, the, of each community. It's also cru crucial as well to um, engage the public, bring them along. Um, you know, don't, uh, uh, there's um, a, a quote that I'm fond of uh, referring to um, by the former mayor of uh, the District of Saanich, Frank Leonard. Uh, and this came out actually in the, the first newsletter, AMBC newsletter uh, in the fall of 2010. He said, never advance a solution to an issue prior to having public awareness of the issue or the solution may become the issue. Um, and, and that's an interesting phrase or a way of saying that, you know, if, if you don't uh, identify the needs, um, but at the same time, maintain the public's uh, trust, um, you know, if you, I'm sorry, I'm misphrasing that, but it is actually, you do need to identify the needs, but you can't be looking at uh, the sky is falling when you're talking to uh, the public, or you're going to um, you're going to lead to a, a situation where they they start to um, distrust the the you know and think that you're not doing your job. So their approach was to not the, describe the problem as if that sky was falling um, or the result of poor management, but rather to as a problem that needed to be addressed. Um, and could be addressed over a longer period. So for Sanich at the, at the time, and I think there's still leaders in asset management, um, that time period was uh, 15 to 19 years. Uh, so it's taken decades to uh, get to the infrastructure gap that we have, and it'll take decades probably to get out of it. So what is asset management? I can tell you that asset management is not a plan. It's not software. It's not data collection. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not just the job of staff and consultants. It's everybody's job. It isn't uh, a profession. It isn't a department. It isn't a plan. It's not software. It isn't a set of tools. It, it isn't a series of processes and it isn't an ISO standard. It's a system of thought. It's a paradigm. It's a way of understanding how people and processes and tools come together to deliver services. It's the way we evaluate, interpret, and judge citizens' needs. And it's the framework by which we decide how these needs are met. That's actually uh, taken from an article that um, uh, Dwayne Nickel, who's the CAO of the city of Selkirk in Manitoba, wrote um, in a fairly recent. AMBC um, newsletter article. Um, he, he, he basically took the position that asset management isn't a core part of city government. It is city government. And I, I mean, I strongly believe that that approach is where we need to be heading. I believe that for some time. So it was quite refreshing uh, to see Duane um, write that himself um, and sort of reiterate the feelings that I had in a way that I think people can, you know, it resonates with, with folks. So that's, you know, why I put it out there. So what do people in our community need um, and, and uh, or want? They want safe and sustainable services in a predictable and cost-effective manner. Um, it's about the service. Asset man management uh, processes formalizes existing asset management practices. It gives them rigor and structure. It gives us sound information. It helps to determine how best to invest in our assets so that our residents can continue to enjoy the services and amenities that contribute to their 
quality of life and well-being so that they can receive and value those services without disruption. So the key asset management success factors, there's three of them. Governments, uh, governance and leadership, um, strategic planning and priorities, council and board asset management policies, bylaws, strategies, the list goes on there. Effective leaders establish a clear vision and then create a culture that enables vision to, that vision to be achieved. They also align activity towards a common purpose and motivate employees to achieve that purpose. Developing an organizational values and culture which guide how an organization works. Again, when I was, uh, I pulled from the city of Courtney, this was also something that was clearly um, part of many organizations, uh, building that corporate culture, that organizational culture. We developed core values. Uh, the five are people matter, be accountable, depend on each other, pursue, pursue excellence and celebrate success. Um, all five were, were uh, put in the form of a hand. Um, and uh, you know, leaders also need to communicate the vision and the strategy to achieve the vision and uh, sufficient and appropriate resources, uh, make sure that those are available to, to the organization. They also have to head up and, and um, support monitoring progress and performance and take corrective action as required. The other, the other key element of asset management, as I alluded to before, is organization-wide implementation and communication. Um, that is absolutely essential. And leadership is a top-down top and bottom-up approach. Um, so there's lots to be said about that, but um, I won't get into it at this point in time. The third and final um, uh, key factor for asset management success is building capacity and competencies. Capacity is actually numbers, the number of staff. I, I talked about the public works experience at Courtney. Um, competencies are, are the skills and the training that you have, each staff person has to do their job. And so that those two are absolutely essential if you're going to build an effective organization-wide asset management program. So Moving on towards the end of the presentation here, um, this is where I'm going to attempt, I guess, to make the connection. Uh, and I think it's an easy one to make um, between uh, the process of asset management and the principles of uh, community economic development. Local governments are the most accessible and responsible form of government, and they're responsible for 60% of the country's infrastructure and while only receiving 10% of the total tax revenue. I think that was uh, something that Roy Brook po pointed out in his previous presentation. Local government asset management is place-based. It's community controlled through the election and level of service processes. And it's focused on sustainable service delivery for current and future generations. Elected officials have the ability to establish policies that recognize and support diversity and inclusion uh, through things like recreational subsidies, um, affordable housing and homelessness initiatives. The list goes on. So the CED principles and asset management benefits are intertwined. And there's at least seven examples here that I'm outlining that of how asset management supports uh, the five principles uh, uh, of, um, of CED. Local governments, you know, really um, uh, rely on these infra infrastructure networks. Um, they're, um, they're focused on providing the services, as I mentioned, and these services uh, lead to, if done correctly, um, with good asset management practice to, uh, practices to uh, solid uh, community economic development and societal well-being. Um, sustainable societies are also, of course, uh, right in the mix there. Um, and interestingly as well, um, good quality infrastructure is, is uh, a cornerstone to public health and safety. 
I won't read them all off. You can see see them for yourself. And I'm running past my my time here, so I'll just uh, leave it with you. I will make these um, slides available to um, Ryan uh, for uh, for uh, your uh, review. Okay, we're winding down here. So economic reconcili uh, reconciliation and asset management. Um, I. I took this uh, slide actually from um, uh, uh, some uh, writings by uh, Robert Costanza, who um, was the editor and publisher, I believe, in uh, 1989 and for several years after that um, for the Journal of Ecological Economics. Um, I was uh, I was attending the University of Waterloo uh, for environmental studies at the time, uh, well, in 91, um, and I was really struck with this um, notion of connecting uh, economics and uh, ecology. Ecology and economics share the same Greek root, oikos, O-I-K-O-S, meaning house. Uh, ecology literally means the study of the house, while economics means the management of the house, where the house is taken to be the world. The three interrelated goals of ecological economics are sustainable uh, scale, fair distribution, um, and efficient allocation. All three of these contribute to human well being and sustainability. Ecological economics recognizes that humans are part of nature, not apart from it. Um, and, and it's a complex, interdependent, and continually evolving uh, whole system. The economy is fundamentally embedded within society, which is embedded within the rest of nature. So these are the, the elements. And, you know, I think when you look at First Nations, um, uh, sort of uh, perspectives and culture and the way that they they are storytellers and engage uh, with uh, personal um, relations in a way that's uh, so fundamental to the way that they build trust and pass knowledge. Um, sound governance and policies uh, for sustainable service delivery are an area that I think uh, it very much mirrors some of the First Nations economic reconciliation works that have been done. I can see opportunities in connecting uh, connecting land in place, um, uh, natural asset inventories and protection, as well as um, I think asset management provides a, a fundamental component um, and back to the fact that 30, over 30% 30 of the attendees at uh, this year's um, a conference, Asset Management BC conference, were from First Nation communities. First Nation uh, asset management training, capacity building and employment is a hugely um, opportune, um, uh, you know, process that we could undertake to build their capacity and their community economic development, as well as hopefully move towards some kind of economic reconciliation. That is really the end of my presentation. I apologize, I've gone a bit over time, um, but I'm happy to, uh, to take any questions. Before we do, I just wanted to again, thank you. Um, very insightful presentation. Um, very, very interesting stuff with asset management and its overlap. And I love the ex with overlap with CED and uh, economic reconciliation. I really love those connections. Tanya, you had the first question, go ahead. Hi, um, David, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my name is Tanya Hebron with the Fraser Basin Council, uh, and I'm the Acting Program Manager of the Climate and Energy Resilience Program. We received some funding from FCM uh, to deliver um, two training workshops or a series of training workshops on uh, asset management. Um, the communities are in Northeast BC. And I'm just curious to know how this framework developed in conjunction with UBCM aligns or differs with it, with the FCM framework? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because I think they're very aligned, if not completely. Um, the, the asset management framework, of course, was uh, came out originally in 2014, again, updated in 2019. Asset Management BC was, um, 
was one of the uh, cohorts, I guess you could say, uh, through the um, uh, MAMP program, the FCM uh, Municipal uh, yeah. Asset Management Program. And so I think there's a, a very strong uh, correlation and alignment. Um, and in fact, that um, MAP program has a technical working group, which uh, I've been invited to participate in from time to time and uh, present at uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, and uh, they have an annual, uh, actually it's coming up in late February, uh, 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 a gathering of uh, all the folks that are, have been involved or contributed to the MAP program. And I'm, I'll be going to that. So there's Asset Management BC is basically in a nutshell, a community of practice. And that community of practice um, is based in BC, but there's other communities of practice right across uh, the country. And FCM is doing a, a great job, I think, of um, supporting um, these communities of practice and bringing them together to collaborate on how we go forward, uh, you know, and 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 move to the next uh, challenge in in asset management. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thanks, Danny. Any other questions? If there's a little lull here, I'll ask a question. Uh, in your key success factors for asset management, you mentioned communication, and it seems internal that communication internal within the municipality. How do you make it community-wide? How do you get them to understand the cost of all this infrastructure and the need to, uh, well, let's say fix it before it breaks? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question as well. Um, well, communication has to be both internal and external. Um, it's, I, I think it's not that either one is uh, takes priority over the other, but I think if you're gonna, uh, before you, it's sort of like Frank Leonard said, don't let the issue, you know, become the issue. Um, you you still need to have um, an understanding with, and a, a sort of an approach in your own organization to do um, asset management. It doesn't mean you have to be um, fully mature in, in the delivery of that. Um, but you first have to get your house in order before you go forth and start engaging with the public. So, the message is, um, you know, where it really comes down to it is through levels of service, um, because, and that's the role of uh, the elected officials, right? Um, the elected officials will make decisions about levels of service. That is, um, how much, and it's based on people's, uh, the community's um, uh, willingness to pay for those services, so or ability to pay. So where that engagement takes place is when you. Um, you, you get to the point where you feel ready to engage um, with the community um, about levels of service. Um, you have a baseline level of service that exists, whether you know what it, whether, whether you know what it is or not, it's there because you're providing services already. So um, it's first important to kind of get your foundational work done, sort of understand what you have, what services you provide, what are the assets that go into the, uh, providing those services, and then um, what, uh, what it costs to provide those services. And then you get to the point where I think you're ready to engage on um, any changes you may need or want to make to those levels of service. And that may be because your budget is typically constrained and you can't um, add uh, more to a diminishing uh, number, right? So that's where um, the education for the uh, the public, bringing them into that discussion about what the what the services are, what because often they don't even know what what services uh, they're receiving or that local government provides compared to the province or the federal uh, government. So it's an ongoing process. It's got to um, be done uh, uh, with uh, time in mind. And uh, you've got to have a long time horizon typically to, to have a meaningful and um, fruitful engagement process with the, the community. That's great, thanks. So I would say, uh, you can see on the last slide, there's, yeah. um, you know, uh, we've got social media involvement through LinkedIn and, and uh, Twitter, uh, at least for now. And uh, we, um, 
you'll see the hashtags and, and uh, various things there. I'm also uh, happy to, um, if anybody wants to reach out to me directly uh, with questions um, or has questions about um, whether or not we could help with any training or um, just, you know, having uh, uh, general discussions uh, on moving forward with your own training programs, um, I'm, I'm available um, as needed. So thanks again for the opportunity today. Awesome. Thanks, David. I do have uh, one more question and maybe that provides some time for, for others to, uh, to have a second thought. I, and I want to tie together a few str strands of, of thoughts. One on your comment about it's everyone's job, but it's no one's job. That's asset management. And how do in reconciliation of those truths. Also, it, asset management seems to be doing a great job of cr creating meaningful plans for operations and maintenance and planner planning departments within municipalities. Do you have any advice for CEDOs, community economic development officers, and those with, with similar uh, roles and responsibilities in both local government and uh, in other key nonprofit organizations and communities to adopt and follow more of that forward-looking planning process? Because I find CEDOs tend to get pulled in uh, in many directions, usually depending on which way the wind is blowing or which way the, the current economic conditions are. How can principles of asset management and the work that you've done and your group has done provide some waypoints for CEDOs to be better at planning long term? Well, I think, uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Ryan. I, I think this is an untapped area. And um, in fact, I, I thank you for the opportunity to present here because it got me thinking um, as I put together the presentation about these connections uh, between CED and asset management. And I think it's an area that needs to be further um, explored, um, even at the academic, uh, well, maybe especially at the academic uh, level. Um, uh, maybe, you know, I'm not aware of some of the work that's been done out there connecting asset management and uh, CED, but um, as far as I know, there's not a huge amount. And I think um, being that sustainable service delivery is the fundamental goal of asset management, I think it's imperative that we do more work on, um, on understanding how those linkages might um, help us work together. I mean, it's systems thinking, right? Uh, these are both, um, uh, this is an approach that we have to get uh, into our heads and, and it's gotta become part of the new normal. Um, you know, climate change, natural assets, uh, planning, operations, uh, community economic development, they're all different aspects of the same big puzzle. And so I think, um, you know, we've gotta do uh, more work collectively on understanding these linkages because so often I think uh, elected officials and the public uh, seem to think they're all little different pieces out there doing their own thing. And maybe partly that's true, um, but we've got to try and pull those things, those desperate, disparate things together because at the end of the day, um, you know, the economy is part of ecology. It doesn't exist without the environment. And, uh, we won't be around if we don't learn how to, um, you know, become a more uh, effective at, at uh, regulating our own activities and actions in, in, in that way. Um, so I think there's work to be done. Um, I don't have the answers. I can see the linkages, but um, we've got to we've got to do more work on um, on drawing out what those linkages mean and how we can work together to. Um, do that for the benefit of society writ large. Awesome. Thanks, David. And Christine, go ahead. Thanks, David. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, SFU, for hosting this dialogue. Um, so I have to say there, there that disconnect. So I re Ryan, yeah, you, you nudged me along. I was like, ah, oh, no, I put up my hand. Because I always seem to fumble through things when I'm using the verbiage. But at any rate, David, when you had said about getting your house in order before you communicate. I thought, no, because what I'm finding is that people, communities, the electorate doesn't make the connection between levels of service, the need for local government, the need for good governance, and how this all supports economic development, community economic development. 
And so we still have people, because we just had our local government elections, where there's people up there saying, I will decrease your taxes. I, and, and immediately I'm going, hey, people, shut them down, shut them down. Because yeah. as soon as you do that, you should be, and this is Wally Wells sitting on my shoulder. As soon yeah. as you hear that, you should be asking, okay, so what, what services are you cutting? Because yeah, that's right. Yeah, Because until Absolutely. people make those connections, right? But just the same as community economic development. Uh, people that do community economic development won't invest in a community unless you have your house in order because they need to be able to rely upon infrastructure, levels of service. Not only that, but to invest in other services. So to draw other services into your community, you have to have the infrastructure that supports arts and culture, that supports health and wellness, that supports otherwise people will not invest. So asset management, as you know, David, um, astute asset management is a process that very much re uh, is relied upon by community economic development, but communicated out right from the beginning. Hey, as a local government, we're getting going on our asset management strategy and our plan, and this is what it means, and mm -hmm. this is how you benefit from it. And bring them along on that story with you so that people can go, oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, that is why my taxes are necessary mm -hmm. versus damn taxes, I don't know why I have to pay for those damn taxes, when really, no, 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 taxes are wonderful. Let's just apply good governance, accountability, transparency, and equity yeah. while using those taxes so that we all benefit. Yes, yeah, so I'll get off my soapbox there. Yeah, you know what? It's it's great. I, I totally agree with everything you said. And I, I think sometimes because I'm so steeped in this, I I may not uh, get the message across in the way that I, I, I would like. But when I say, you know, get your house in order before you engage on levels of service, that doesn't mean don't engage early and often. Nice. It's just about engage on what services you provide. You don't have to get into a debate, you know, or a discussion with um, the the community uh, prematurely about levels of service. Mm. You can have the discussion about the services. These are the services we provide. You know, I know my former co-chair, Andy Wardell from the District of North Vancouver, you know, he talked about how they invited in the public during their budget preparations and how they had a very, um, you know, detailed discussion with a large, you know, uh, contingent of their public on just what kind of services um, they have, why, what they're spending on these services, what, you know, how those services Precisely. are supported by the assets. So that was an educational opportunity. And he told me that the people that came in with their uh, with their eyes, uh, you know, shooting, uh, you know, blanks and and um, very upset, actually, through that process, the vast majority of them left with a, a greater appreciation for what local government services are all about and how they're delivered. So I would never say don't engage with uh, folks. I would just not get into a debate about levels of services until you've had okay. that discussion about what it is you do uh, provide in the way of service, right? Beautiful story. Uh, and I know Andy's, he's another one. He's another one of our elders in asset management, but it's those stories, right, David, that we need to share so that people can see themselves in it and yeah, the roles we all play. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for chatting today, David. Well, once again, David, thank you for uh, your wonderful public lecture. Uh, and thank you all for attending today.